certainly a pleasure to be with you all today. I, I have to admit that, you know, when you're when you're asked to speak on a topic like civility in politics, it sort of feels like you're getting. For those of you who are, you know, members of, of the church that I'm a member of, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, or maybe some other ch some other church, and you're asked to speak on some important topic, sometimes you feel like you're being asked to speak on that topic because maybe you've got some work to do in that area yourself. And I have to admit, I feel that way uh, now. You know, it, 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 civility in politics is an important issue. It's one that, you know, I work to be civil in, in, in my political work, um, but it's one that, you know, we all fall short on in, in, some, in some way or fashion, um, but it's, it doesn't mean that, you know, we should, we should not herald the importance of this issue and, and work and strive to be better as we go. Um, and so I, I make the remarks and have the discussion I have with you today in, in that spirit that, you know, um, although even, although I, I fall short and we all fall short in this regard, it's, it's important um, nevertheless to, to strive to be better. You know, I, I want to thank the, the Ethics Center and, and the Appomattox Project for, for having me here, for giving me the opportunity to, to discuss this issue with you. You know, I, I think that civility in politics sometimes sounds uh, a little bit, so it kind of sounds like a boring topic. And I hear some chuckles out there. So I want to ask an honest show of hands and be honest, okay, because I kind of agree with you in, in a way if, if you answer yes to this. How many people in the room kind of think that this sounds a little bit like a, a boring topic, civility in politics? Okay, got some, some hands around, some hands around. Okay, good. All right, you're being honest. I think it, it, it has the tendency to sound kind of boring. I agree with you. Um, but hey, when there's pizza involved, you know, we show up anyway. Um, but, but I also, in seriousness, I, I believe that civility in politics is anything but boring. Um, I, I think that it's key to our security, our national security, and to our national prosperity. You know, it, some people think that, you know, those who speak on behalf of civility in politics are naive or unrealistic or dated in their political thinking, and we've moved beyond that now. It's sort of ridiculous to expect or strive for greater civility in politics. But, but I, think that's, I think that misses some important points, and, and hopefully we'll, you know, we'll talk about a, a lot of that uh, today. So um, I, I want to start with a couple of questions for you, and I think we've got some mics on, the, you know, on both sides and in the center. Um, but I want to ask a question, just a very basic question to you, and that is, what is civility to you? And forget about politics. We're going to talk a lot about politics, but let's forget about that for now. Just in general, what is, when you hear civility, what does that, what does that mean? Can we get a, a couple of responses from you? Just by, raise your hand if, you, if you'd like to just offer simply, what, what does that mean to you, civility? We have an ant down here in the front. And I'm gonna ask that you wait for the mic so that everyone can hear, and I know they're recording, so. Uh, yeah, I think. And, uh, and if you could just state your, your first name and then go ahead and make your comment. Yeah, Paul, Paul here. Um, I, I think civility means respect and understanding. Uh, I think the ability to take a step back and look at things objectively has a lot to do with um, showing mutual respect and civility. Okay, I, okay, I, I like that. You know, considering things ob objectively, listening to each other. What else? Let's get a couple, of more, a couple more. Anybody? Okay, way in the back, in the blue, green. Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. I think it means putting aside your own opinions to listen to someone else. Okay, very good. Very good. And in the very back, one more. Katie, civility is when you can disagree with somebody and still keep a cool head and still be kind and re recognize your sames more than you recognize your differences. Civility means being not only in control, but also having an opinion, and that opinion can stay the same because we all exercise civility. Wow, okay, these are great answers, all three of them. Okay, now I wanna, I wanna ask just the opposite of that. What is incivility? Again, not, not necessarily political. In fact, I'm just on the, in the most general terms asking, what's, when, we, when you hear the word incivility, what do you think of? How about this side of the room, I think? You know, it's, it's your turn. Okay, we got one up here with a 
down jacket? So I think incivility would probably oh, mean... Give us your name oh, first. <clears throat> sorry, Caleb. Caleb. Um, incivility, I think, would be, in a general term, not working together in a society um, where you're separating yourself from other people and not being able to work with other people on anything. And that would slow down uh, society and civilization. So incivility that way. Wow, okay, another really good comment, thank you. You said your name was C Caleb? Caleb? You guys are so far ahead of me, I think I can just wrap up right now. Okay, very, very good, one, one more. This, on this side, I thought I saw some other hands in this area, no? Okay, on this side, was there one more? Incivility on this side, yep. My name is Tyler. Um, <clears throat> I would say a huge part of it is just when you assume the worst about someone you disagree with, you okay. just assume that they're out to get you. Yeah, that's right. That's good. What was your name again? Tyler. Tyler. Okay, good. All right, let me ask another question. When you hear people call for civility, does that rub any, any of you the wrong way? You think, think, you know, really consider the way you feel about this. Do, do you ever hear somebody call for civility and it, it rubs you in the wrong way for some reason? Anybody? It, it, the gentleman in the back with the coat, a hand up. Please give us your name. My name is Cade. Cade, nice to meet you. Um, it seems to me that when someone calls for civility, that implies that the conversation up until that point has been uncivil and therefore somehow wrong. Right? Okay. And so maybe it's the idea that, you know, somebody's making a point or advocating for someone and somebody's, somebody else is telling them to be civil and, and it, it may be more of a commentary on whether they agree with what the other person is saying or not rather than how they're saying it. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah, okay. Great point. Who else? Calls for civility and you kind of, gentleman in the back with the hoodie. Um, I'm Roger. Hi, Roger. And I think it really depends on who the messenger is and our given experience with the messenger of who's asking for civility and then looking at their prior uh, civility themselves. So maybe somebody says, hey, we need to be more civil, but they themselves are not civil at all. Some hypocrisy always kind of leaks into that conversation, yes. Sure, yeah, fair point. Okay, very good point. Okay, who else? It rubs you the wrong way a little bit. All right, gentleman uh, in the black uh, hoodie. Please give us your name. Uh, Carter. Carter. And sometimes it just feels inauthentic, like really they're grasping for public support rather than feeling like it actually is uncivil. Okay, great. So you might see some politicians do that where they call for civility as sort of a political opportunity rather than actually caring about the issue of civility. Um, any other, any, you maybe hear from a woman on this. We'll, we'll get to you in, in a second, sir. Any comments from, here we go, in the front. Hi, I'm Jamie. Hi, Jamie. I also feel like whenever someone calls for civility, sometimes things require a little bit more, um, I guess, loudness is mm -hmm. a good way to say it. So you're going to be more loud about it, and you're going to say, this is how I feel. And then whenever they call for civility, they're saying, hey, calm down. It's not that intense. And you're like, but this is an important issue. Right, you right. That's a, that's a very important point. So let me ask a related, a related question to that. Is it possible to debate and, and advocate for something strenuously without being uncivil? Does it, if you're debating or arguing for something strenuously, does that necessarily mean you're being uncivil? Or is that, are they, can, they, can, you, can you fight hard for something but still be civil? Any, gentleman in the hat? I'm William, and I find that yes, you can debate strenuously with while still being civil because, well, while you might get somewhat excited about a topic, that does not mean you need to devolve into a shouting match or ridiculing the other side. You can still be somewhat polite while still holding a strong opinion about something. Yeah, great comment. Thank you. And then the gentleman in the orange hoodie. Behind you. You had your hand up before. Oh, sorry. Did you want to make a comment too? No? Okay. You're like, get this mic out of my hands. 
Um, so uh, my name is Jacob. My comment was actually on the last. Jacob? Jacob, yes. Yeah, go ahead with your comment. Yeah. My comment was actually on the last point. Yeah. Um, I, to be frank, don't even remember what the question was at this point. I asked, like, do you, if, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. That happens to me all the time, usually when I'm on television. I'm like, what are we talking about? Um, but, uh, but no, what I asked was, when you hear people calling for civility, does it elicit a sort of, does it ever rub you the wrong way or elicit sort of a negative feeling in you when you hear somebody calling for civility? And, and I'm just asking, you know, what, tell me more about that. So the only reason that I, again, Jacob, the only reason I think that it would rub me the wrong way is because I feel like it is someone else um, asking me or requesting or, or even in some situations requiring me to change the way that I act because they're uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, in, in civil debates, I guess, in public and things like that can make sense. Um, but in one-on-one in -on -one discourse, which is I think where the most change happens, mm -hmm. I feel like you have to have two parties coming into it willing to communicate civilly. So. Yeah, great, that's a great, great comment. Thank you so much for that. So, you know, it, it's true that sometimes calls for civility, as I think you're, you're alluding to and others have, calls for civility are used to sometimes silence people who are fighting for things that are good and, and people who are fighting for things that are good and doing it in, in a right or necessary way. You know, I, 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 rem, you know, I think back to, you know, the founding of our country and, and uh, at least one of my forefathers fought in the Revolutionary War. Of course, that was a very extreme example. You know, our, our national ancestors went to war for, for our independence and freedom. The Brits said that they were uncivil. You know, that, you know in a, knowing a thing or two about you know, my ancestors' DNA, they probably, they probably were uncivil. Um, but nevertheless, they were, they were fighting for something that was, was important. You know, more recent examples include, you know, women in, who in the 1800s in America were fighting, struggling for the right to vote. They were called uncivil just because they wanted to be able to vote, you know, or African Americans in, in the 1950s who, uh, you know, wanted, who were, who were struggling for their basic civil rights, uh, Rosa Parks, you know, uh, on the bus and others, uh, they were called uncivil. And, and I think if, if we look at those two examples, at least, saying nothing of my ancestors in, in the revolutionary times, you know, they were behaving very civilly and they were called uncivil because they were fighting for an important change. Um, and so it's true. And so I think sometimes when we hear people call for civility, you know, some, sometimes they abuse that word and use it to, to, to silence people. Um, and I think it, it can happen on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, but it's important that we understand that that sometimes happens, but, and that's not good, but it doesn't undermine the truth that civility, I think, is, actual civility is very important. And we'll, we'll talk some more about that. You know, um, last year there was a moment in our po politics, and I, I don't even want to raise exactly what it was because it was so divisive and I don't want to divide the room. Um, we're off to a good start. Um, but... There was a very divisive moment in American politics where even people who are a part of, you know, my work at Stand Up Republic and, uh, and you know, other sort of efforts to sort of build unity around our core values in America and our system of self-government, um, there was a moment that divided a lot of even those people. And, you know, nowadays the, the, the town square is, is Twitter for the, for, for, to, to a great extent. And so... I, I tweeted a comment calling for basically civility and warning against, you know, um, uh, descending into eye for an eye politics, I think I called it. And, and I really wasn't targeting either side of, of the debate. I, I was really just in general saying to people that, hey, we've got to have civility here. And it was interesting. I mean, they, a, a lot of people liked and shared the, the, the post. Um, but it, it also uh, elicited thousands of responses. And I have to admit that most of those responses were negative. Um, and, you know, some of you have probably seen the Jimmy Kimmel's mean tweets thing where he takes a, like an athlete and he has them read the tweets that mean tweets people have uh, sent in in response to them or whatever. Well, you know, these aren't exactly mean tweets, but I, I want to read you some of the responses 
to, to my call for civility on, on that occasion, okay? Um, the first one came from someone who goes by the name Banana Farang. <laughs> Mr. McMullen, we've long passed the stage of fight fire with decency and civil order. When all norms are out the window, bring the cannon to the gunfight. Here's another one from Maurice. You want to wear boxing gloves to a street fight? Sorry, but we're beyond that. Being so civil and PC is part of why we're in this mess. We need to plow them over. Another one from Joe. I admire your values, but this is not a winning strategy. Turning the other cheek is fine for Jesus, but it's not how you win in life. You win back by punching back 10 times harder. And another uh, comment from a concerned citizen, uh, Gin and Juice, that's her name. <laughs> They rely on our norms to beat us, so forget them. I edited that one slightly. <laughs> I bet you can guess which word. Um, and will. There is no reason to unilaterally disarm. There are more important items on the table than civility. Or this one from Blastmaster Bemo. I mean, how do people come up with these? I don't know. More creative than I am. Um, this is going to be an ugly time in hashtag American politics, but that's just something we're going to have to deal with. Turn the other cheek is a nice fable and all, but. And then there was, uh, you know, one last one, which I'll, I'll note. They took the time to actually make a meme, and, and the meme said, bald, and then another word for donkey. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that was directed at me. I'll just, um, I'm going to put that person in the winnable but not yet convinced category. But, um, you know, to, to, the, to the point, you know, those tweets, by the way, you know, you sort of look at their profiles and you can tell, are they on the right or the left or whatever. Those tweets came from people on the right and the left. So both sides felt like the other side was so far gone that, you know, in the words of the one uh, person, forget them, we were going to just, we, there's no room for civility, it, that's, you know, that, that's not going to work here, and the, the other side's so far gone that we just, we have to do something else, and it, it certainly doesn't have anything to do with civility. Um, and so, you know, and, and so that's where, um, and so that, that takes us to a, a dangerous place politically. Um, but let me take a step back and, and, and let's talk about ourselves as humans. You know, there's been some interesting research recently and in the past done at, at Stanford and UC Berkeley and other institutions about how we're wired as human beings, as mammals, uh, and how that impacts um, political tribalism and divisions. So there's, um, there's a, a, a well-known neuroscientist at Stanford, uh, Dr. Solpolsky, who wrote a recent piece that um, reflected some of the work other people have done, but he took it a little bit farther. And he talked about how we are wired to quickly put people into different categories. Either, you know, we look at people and we decide very quickly they're part of our group or they're part of another group. And he calls them in-groups and out-groups. And so we look around all the time and just by looking at people, put them into categories. They're either with us or they're in an out-group. And what happens also is that we then very quickly feel positive feelings and generosity and empathy towards people who we think are like us and in our in-group and to feel animosity and hostility towards people who we think are in an out-group. And in fact, one study uh, showed people pictures of um, people of their own race being poked with a needle, okay? And the, the study found that, that when that happened, the part of our brain that where, where sympathy or empathy comes from engaged, you know, actively. It activated um, upon seeing somebody of your, our own race being poked with a needle. But when we're shown pictures of people of another race who don't look like us, and they're being, you know, I mean, they look like us because they're also human beings, but they just happen to have a different color of skin, being poked by a needle, they, um, you know, our brain, that part of the brain that where sympathy comes from, empathy comes from, didn't activate as much. 
that's pretty concerning. But it's, you know, it's, it's part of this, this neuroscience of, of, um, of, of this in-group, out-group phenomenon that this doctor and others have, have written about. Now, there's, um, there's this compound in our brains called oxytocin. It's, it exists in the brains of mammals. And oxytocin does some really positive things. One of the things it does is it, it strengthens the bonds between mothers and infants, between people in relationships, between f friends and family members. It, it inspires you know, positive social behaviors like the ones I mentioned before, sympathy, generosity, um, you know, concern, all of these things. Uh, but oxytocin research has also discovered oxytocin also does some things that are, are um, uh, that, that have negative implications in this in this context at least, and that is for people who are in the out group or in out groups, it actually inspires fear and hostility. Now you could imagine why all of that might be sort of a, you know a deep you know survival mechanism that might have been useful you know long ago maybe to some degree in some situations it's still useful but you can see how um, how this creates this could create some challenges politically you know another study showed that in another study a researcher a psychologist took a group of complete strangers and with that group of complete strangers um, they divided them into two separate groups um, and they did that by flipping a coin. So it was arbitrary whether you ended up in one group or the other. You didn't know if you were in, participating in this research study, you didn't know any of these people. You showed up, they were complete strangers, there's some coin flipping and you end up in one group or the other. Well, the research, the study showed that within minutes people felt you know, more um, inclined to spend time with the group they had been assigned to. They had pe more feelings of empathy towards this group and feelings of hostility to the other group. Even though they, had, they, they did not know these people, they were still essential strangers. They had just been assigned to their group a few minutes ago. And yet you know, they had these positive feelings for their own group and negative feelings towards the other group. You know, another study showed that you know, while we do um, tend to um, put people in in-groups or out-groups based on race, that can quickly change. One study showed people pictures of, of different races, other people of different races, but then they showed them more pictures of those people either wearing a red uniform, I forget what the colors were, so don't quote me on this, but you know, a red uniform or a white uniform. So no matter what the race of the person was, they would be wearing a red or a white uniform. And automatically, the people who participated in the study stopped categorizing people by race and instead just switched to uniform. And so there's both some concerning elements of that and some, some uh, you know, areas for optimism, perhaps. The concerning element is just how quickly we decide who's in our group and who's not in our group and how powerful that is from a you know, from our, our, you know, a neurological perspective and how dangerous it can be or how, how negative it can be towards people who are not in our in-group. Um, but it also, this, all this body of research also shows that, you know, we can change that really quickly and we can actually decide how we think about our in-group and out-group. And so I, I would argue and have been arguing for the last few years that, you know, we should consider all of each other as Americans at the very least, we should consider ourselves all a part of the same in-group. And if we do that, just imagine sort of the changes sort of chemically in our brains that that, that causes. You know, I, and I would say we could go even deeper than that. I mean, there are certain things that, we have that, that are appropriate for nations and, 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 and citizens to deal with, but you know, you know, with each other and for each other, but we're also part of this human in-group. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. But, but all of this, you know, I'll add that, you know, a lot of political leaders understand this dynamic that, you know, understand that, you know, how powerful this idea of in-groups and out-groups is, and that they know that if they inspire, if they stoke fear, if they other another group, if they say another group, they're not with us, they're not real Americans, you know, they're not, you know, really part of us. Um, they know that they can stoke fear of those people 
and use that fear and harness that fear uh, for their own political benefit. And, and that's something that, you know, we, we hope our politicians, that's a powerful, but I think destructive uh, way to go about politics. But we have political leaders uh, on, the, on the right and on the left who try to exploit this sort of reality of human psychology and neurology to empower themselves quickly to gain a bunch of, you know, strong, you know, em emotionally, you know, committed uh, supporters very quickly. And so I think we, we have to be conscious when we look at our political leaders, if we see them trying to exploit this reality of our human nature uh, in a negative way um, by dividing us and othering us, you know, we, we've, got to, we've got to, in my view, we've got to reject that. But you know, it, it, all of this is having an impact on our politics, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And, and I want to show some slides um, to that end. So, um, you know, Pew Research, they're a polling company, uh, as you know, they, uh, every so often they do research about the, the ideological placement of the American people and of our major political parties. Okay, so how do they do that? They do a big survey and they call a bunch of people like you and like me and they say, are you a Republican or a Democrat or an independent? Are you unaffiliated? Okay. You know, what do you, what's your view on healthcare policy? What's your view on tax policy, on foreign policy? And they, you know, they measure where you are on the ideological spectrum. And then in mass, they're able to tell based on your political affiliation, sort of where the parties are moving ideologically. And so let's take, and so this graph that you see here, this chart shows that. And, and, and let's look a little bit more closely at it. So. Um, what you see there is um, in each one of these years, you've got a red part and a blue part, right? And then you've got a striped part. The red part is the, and this line on the bottom is generally the ideological spectrum. So the further right on this chart you are, or the, the, the area is, the more conservative it is. The further left, the more uh, liberal it is. And obviously, as you can imagine, the red part is, represents the Republican Party. The blue part represents the Democratic Party. And this striped area in the middle is where they overlap, okay? You also see this line going across the middle, this sort of bumpy line. Um, and that, as you see there, is the percentage of US adults that say they're independents, okay? So let's, let's zoom in a little bit closer to 1994. Now, what do we see here? Can I, and I want to get some answers from, from you on this. What, what are, what's one observation? Somebody give me an observation looking at this. What, what's a key takeaway from what you see here in 1994? Probably seems like an eternity ago to you. Yeah, you got a hand here, good. What do you see, sir? Please give me your name. I am Jason McDaniel. Hi, Jason. It appears to be relatively even on both sides besides the middle, which is 38% of independents. Yeah, so, so you're saying that there, there's a lot of overlap between the yeah, two? Yeah, then there's not a lot of red going off to one side or, or blue going off to one That's side. That's right. That, that, I think, is a, a key observation from this. Thank you, Jason. There you go. Thank you very much. All right, what, what else? That, that, I think, is you know, probably the main observation, but there are others. So we have another one down here. Can we wait for the mic, sir? Yeah. And remind us of your name, if you would. Yeah. Uh, Paul again. Uh, it yeah. looks like everyone's a little closer to the middle. Uh, in 94. And so that's the two lines uh, horizontally. Those are the middle, right? Yes, thank you for saying that because okay. I forgot to give that in my explanation. Those so. vertical lines are the ideological centers of gravity of, I, of both parties. Yeah, so it looks like they're both kind of closer to the center. Great, so, so Jason, you said that you know, there, there's a lot of overlap and you're saying that they're also in the center. So that's interesting, that's another very- and Both far right and far left. That's right. So th those are two very key observations. There's a lot of overlap in the center of the political spectrum. That's interesting. Okay, what else? Any other observations from this? Okay, that's good. So note here that that 38%. So you've got a lot of overlap here in 1994, and 38% of Americans are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm an independent. I'm not associated with either one of these parties. Okay. So let's fast forward 10 years. 
okay? Now I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna toggle back and forth for a second, and I'm gonna ask you the question, what's changed? And I'm gonna ask for you to tell me, okay? So, so watch here. So again, 1994, take a good look. I mean, it's not a huge change, but there are changes that are important. 2004. Again, 1994. 2004. What do we see? What changed? Okay, hold, hold on for a second. I feel like I gotta. We need some. We need some more answers from this side of the room. I know you're making observations over here. Okay, right here, in the in the green jacket. It's a bold move wearing that jacket. Yeah, I thanks. respect that. Uh, so my name's Skyler. Skyler. Um, okay. Looks like the independents went down by quite a bit. And then the other main observation I'd say is that there's more color where they're not overlapping. So. Yep. That's 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 interesting. There is, there does seem to be. Slightly, um, oh, slightly more color where they're not overlapping. Um, but the number of independents goes down. That's yeah, right. It's pretty dramatic, 8%. So. Yeah, it's a, that's a dramatic shift. What else do we see there? Uh, we'll go with the orange hoodie again. Remind me of your name, sorry. So Jacob again. Jacob, yeah. So 2004, obviously, this is uh, pretty relatively soon after 9-11. Yeah. And it seems like the, the graph has shifted to the right a lot more polarizing, right? So the red or the Republicans um, became a lot more uh, extreme, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's, it seems like there, there are more people shifted in that direction. That's right. Now in the back, I think we had, a, thank you very much, Jacob. In the back, we have another observation that I saw a hand back there. Now I don't think I see the person, the hand and the person disappeared. <laughs> okay. Um, Anybody else? I think there, there's some. Yeah, it was you, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I was noticing that the direction of skew changed from 1994 to 2004. Can you say that again? Here, uh, yeah, yeah. Say it in Sorry, the I forgot. Yeah. There's a microphone here. Hi, I'm Robbie. Uh, Hi. In 1994, I'm noticing that there's a tail skew off to the left side, but in 2004, that skew moves to the right side. Even if the center is, I think the center is a little bit more on point. But with 1994, you have a left side tail, and with 2004, you have a right side tail. Yeah, that's interesting. That's super fascinating. So you also said something in there. If you, if you could just keep the mic for a second. You said, I forgot exactly how you said it, but you said something about, so you, I think you were referring to the two lines. Like, what happens to the two lines, the two vertical lines? You see them here how in 1990. They get closer together. They move closer yeah. together in 2004. Yeah, I think... I disagree with uh, whoever it was in here that said that there was a further split in 2004. It doesn't look like there is at all. Okay, I don't so, think there's a significant difference. So it, it looks like there's, there's some more people on, uh, you know, maybe slightly, you, you know, I, I happen to agree with you. There's, you know, yes, there's some people slightly out, out on the, the ends, um, but the center of gravity, the centers of gravity move closer together actually in 2004, which is interesting because we note that the number of independents goes down to 30%. And so that's just interesting. When, when there was a little more division, there were more independents. When there was less, less division, more overlap, despite the tails, the movement of the tails. Um, when the centers of gravity moved closer together, there were less independents. And I do think you know, the fact that we were just a few years after 9-11 probably had something to do with that. I remember that time. We, we were more united as a country. In 2004, we had recently invaded Iraq, you know, that became an extremely divisive issue. Um, it, it was not so divisive in the beginning. Republicans and Democrats in Congress, most of them supported that. Nationally, it was the same thing. Um, but over time, we sort of changed our, our opinion about that nationally. Um, but, but we were pretty unified in this time. We became more unified over that 10 years, despite some more division on the tails. Okay, great. And so let's let's go on to the next. Let's go. Let's fast forward ten years beyond two thousand four to two thousand fourteen. Now, what do we see? What's a big observation from this? Anybody, anybody who hasn't spoken yet, gentlemen in the back. Well, it goes up to forty percent, and the medians are super far out. So there's a lot more division there. Yeah. Right. So. So the, the parties become much more divided. And then the stripes, the 
where they're kind of split on it, it goes less. So there's more blue and there's more red. So it looks like the country's getting more split. That's right. So that's good. Those are, those are key observations. What else? You know, one thing that I see here is, you know, of course, we see the parties moving further apart. We see independence, the number of independents go up. You know, we don't know for sure why that happened, but we can imagine that maybe these are people who are rejecting this polarization, okay? But one thing, you know, there are, it's amazing, even in 2014, which, even, you know, even you, you're so much younger in your lives than me, but, you know, that doesn't seem like so long ago, right? That was just six years ago. But isn't it interesting that in 2014, there were still quite a number of Republicans who were centrists and even liberal, and there were still quite a lot of Democrats who were centrists or even conservatives. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you sort of think of that now in today's context. If you're liberal, you're, all, you're, you're, you're almost certainly going to be a Democrat or maybe an independent. If you're conservative, you know, that's a little more complicated right now. But if you're a conservative, you're probably a Republican or an independent. Um, but you don't see party affiliation. You don't imagine that there's as much party affiliation that sort of a liberal Republican or a conservative Democrat. You just don't see it. You, you don't imagine it to be the case anyway. But I also want to notice or just note that um, like, this is still a pretty big space of people who are in the middle. You know? And so while you have, you, know, you have a lot of people who still are considering themselves Republicans or Democrats, and you have a lot of people who are rejecting this for whatever reason and calling themselves unaffiliated or independents, um, but you do have the parties themselves are, are moving further apart. So my point is just that there's still a lot of people in 2014 that are rejecting this polarization. You know, they're either becoming independents or they're staying where they are sort of in the center of American politics. So let's move ahead. You know, they, they, the Pew had done this research 10 years at a time, but they decided to do it sooner the next time. And so they did another one in 2017. So let me toggle back and forth here. 2014, 2017, 2014, 2017. All right, now what are we seeing? Observations here. Uh, in, in the back, blue hoodie. W please wait for a mic so everyone can hear you. You have a mic on its way. Um, Roger Chamberlain again. Um, yep. What's the volume metric of like the blue and the red represent? That's one part I don't understand on these graphs. As far as the peaks? It's where, um, you know, they're taking individual people and they're, they're placing individual people uh, somewhere on the ideological spectrum. And so if you see a higher, a higher, you know, amount of Democrats that are right here, you're seeing that this is, you know, they've, they've said basically you're that liberal and you belong in, in that place on the political spectrum. Gotcha. So then yeah. what we're seeing here is that um, the division, as far as that middle, stays pretty similar. 40 to 46 percent isn't that huge. But what we're seeing is that the extreme ends are becoming much more amplified. That those who consider themselves very red or very blue are very much polarized completely. The dialogue's done. Right. For, for, for many people, yeah, exactly. What, what, thank you very much for that. Right, some other observations. You have a gentleman in a blue sweatshirt with a W on it. Um, something I noticed is along with that, the, the people who are moderate, the people who stay in the middle, they're not very opinionated on their moderatism. They're, they're very, it seems like, opposed to the, the two aspects. So you've got the two peaks. They're, they're either more Republican and they, they're more proud of it. Or they're more Democrat and more proud of it. But then the people who don't affiliate with one or the other, they're kind of just, yeah, I'm just kind of in the middle. They're yeah. kind of half-hearted with it, it almost seems like. But the, but the percent increases with every graph, so that means there's more of that. And, that, and if you split it, down, if you split it actually the, my, the majority is in moderate. They just don't know what they believe, maybe. I don't, I don't know. They okay. don't know what affiliate with. All right, well, good. So, so you raise a good question. So these people in the middle... Do they have ideas or, you know, you're, you're sort of suggesting that maybe they don't, they don't have, you know, strong feelings either way. And so they're just in the middle. Um, but, you know, I, I, I might challenge you a little bit on that. I'm not sure that's the case. I think in some cases it, it may be.
But I think that there are also people who are in this space who feel strongly about the issues. It's just that on the ideological spectrum, their positions on those issues are in the middle. And you know, that's just where they are. And as these sides go out to the left and out to the right, you know, their opinions aren't changing. Some of them, I'll say, I do think it's a, I do think, you know, in three years time, a 40 to 46, you know, percent increase, a 6% increase from 40% to 6% uh, of the number of American adults saying that they're independents. I do think that that's, that's significant. Of course, it oscillates during the year. I picked sort of, you know, the same date every year for that. Um, but I, I think one positive thing here is still that there are a lot of people who are still in, in the middle, sort of not becoming polarized. They're either independents or they're members of either party, and they're still sort of, they have a lot of common ground with members of the other party. Okay, so we've talked a lot about that, but you know, one natural question after showing these slides is, okay, what are the causes of this, okay? So there, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we could really have an entire discussion about what the causes are. Um, but I think there, there are several, there are several things we could discuss. You know, in the country over the last few decades, we've had wage stagnation. So that increases economic pressure for a lot of people. Almost 60% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck. Of course, you know, we have tons of student loans, about a trillion dollars of student loans out there. At the same time, we're experiencing demographic change. And so anytime you have economic pressure and demographic change, it can create a lot of political tension. And, and, and so that's sort of the overall backdrop. But what, but you know, that was true even way back here in 1994 and 2004, but we still had all this overlap. So what happened since 2004? How did we go from this to this in just 10 years, which is not that much time. You think it's a lot of time maybe, but I promise you 10 years from now, when you're 10 years into your careers, you'll think, boy, where did that 10 years go? Where did those 10 years go? It's, it's no time at all. And look how divided we are all of a sudden. So what changed in, be, between 2004 and 2014? I, I would mention a couple of things. You know, number one, our political finance laws changed so that outside groups, like one that I run, I mean, it's sort of bipartisan and seeks to unite people, but most outside political groups, 501c3s and four, or four specifically, are ideologically motivated. And so, you know, and they don't have any governing responsibility. They're not sort of elected to power. They're not parties, so they don't have to govern, but they, they are ideologically motivated and changes in political finance laws allowed them to raise unlimited amounts of dollars. Whereas it, it, at the same time, other changes limited the amounts of money that political parties could raise. And so what that did is that it empowered these outside ideologically motivated groups over the political parties that actually had to govern. They couldn't just be ideologically motivated. They actually had to get things done. But all of a sudden, they you know, can't raise as much money as the, the outside groups can. And so they lose some influence. Another thing that happened in 2004 really was that social media came online, Facebook became a thing, and we all started to get our news in, in information bubbles. So, you know, that Facebook's algorithm and other social media platforms gave us news that they knew we wanted to hear, you know, news that already agreed with us. And that's how a lot of us started to get our news on a daily basis. And so that sort of, I think, contributed to the divisions too. Another thing is gerrymandering, part of extreme partisan gerrymandering. You, you, of course, know that that's when a political party um, sort of takes control of, a, you know, wins the majority in a state legislature and then uses their political power to draw the district lines in such a way that the other party can never compete. And they either do that for state elections and or federal office as well. And when that happens, when you don't have to compete against the other party, you only have to compete for the support of people on your far, on the far ends of the political spectrum. And, uh, you know, that can be, that can lead to, I, that can contribute to this too. So, you know, I see that we are just about out of time already. Is that right? Three minutes? My gosh, that is so terrible. Um, there's so much more, so much uh, more to say. But I, I think I, you know, I want to um, close by by talking a little bit about just finally why civility is so important for two reasons. Civility, I think, is the answer to this. Is the first step in in solving this division. Okay, it is. 
it, it is critical to our national security and prosperity because if this continues, we can't govern ourselves. And so when we treat each other civilly, it does two things. Number one, it upholds the fundamental value that our whole country was founded upon, this idea that we're all created equal and equal under the law. That doesn't mean you know, necessarily equal outcomes. That's a debate between the right and the left I'm not looking to have here. But just to say that on the most fundamental level, when we treat each other with civility and respect, that upholds this value that, that upholds our system of self-government. If we start to think that you know, we're not equal because of the color of our skin or what our religious beliefs or, or our gender or whatever, then that opens the door to our leaders saying, you know what, if you guys aren't equal to each other, then I'm not equal to you and I'm above you and therefore I'm above the law. And then our system of self-government starts to unravel. And when that happens, we lose our freedom, okay? The checks and balances on government power fade away and we lose our freedom. The other thing is that when we're, we treat each other civilly, we remain open to discussion and debate with each other. And that's important because we live in a system of self-government. We govern ourselves through our elected officials most of the time. And in order for that to work, we've got to, we've got to have this healthy competition of ideas. And when we treat each other uh, uncivilly and we withdraw from that competition of ideas and we just start talking to ourselves and not the other side, and what happens is our ideas become weaker because they're not faced with the competition of, uh, of the opposing side. But then over time, they, our ideas start to become even extreme. And that's what you start to see. That's what you see here and in the next slide in 2017 where the both parties are, are, are moving towards the edges of the political spectrum. Now, let me say that sometimes some good ideas do come from the edges of the political spectrum. You know, there was a time when fighting against slavery in America was viewed as a radical idea, but you know, that was a good idea to end slavery, right? We recognize that now. So it's, I'm not here to say that the only good ideas come from the center of the space. That's not true. But I do think most workable, healthy ideas um, often come from that space. Uh, again, not always, and th there are some significant exceptions to that that are very important. Um, but when it comes to our leaders being able to find solutions and advance solutions to modern challenges, whether they be student loans or uh, the coronavirus or information warfare or you know, uh, our national debt or you know, whatever it is, we need to be able, to, we need to be in a place as, as civilians, as, as, as citizens, but also therefore then our leaders need to be in a place where they can find compromises and a way forward. We're a nation of 330 million people. We can have strong feelings to some of your points early on and about an issue, strong ideas, strong, you know, well-resourced, fact-based ideas and still disagree um, with the other side and we can make compromises. In fact, we need to make compromises in order to govern ourselves um, without changing our mind or changing our opinions necessarily about what the issue is. But we are in the same boat together. We are in this together whether we like it or not. And, um, and civility is, is critical to our ability to govern ourselves and meet modern challenges and protect our freedom by protecting our system of self-government. So with that, I want to thank you very much. It was great to speak with you.